Welcome. This is Seaworthy's kickoff event. It's called Ocean Innovation for Scientific Discovery. With us today, we have Dr. Jeff Cayley from Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution and Armada Marine Robotics, as well as, well as Ian Chomcho from National Geographic and Lindblad Expeditions. My name is Daniel Kleinman. I'm the founder of Seaworthy Collective, and I'm also a current Master's of Professional Science student in Exploration Science at the University of Miami. A little quick uh, overview of what today is going to look like. Uh, I'm going to give you a quick uh, intro into who we are. Uh, then we'll jump into some preset questions we have for our panel for you to for you guys to get to know who they are. Uh, then we'll open it up for a Q&A, which at any point, feel free to <coughs> questions in the chat for our speakers. And then at the end, we'll have a group discussion. Uh, I have a question prompted for you guys based off of hopefully what conversation we'll have uh, where we'll get you all involved. And then finally, a little look ahead to what else we have in store later this month and beyond. So why did we launch Seaworthy Collective? Hopefully, if you're in this call, you know a little bit about the oceans and the fact that we're facing things like plastification, warming, acidification, and overfishing, and the list goes on. In my time in the last five years in the marine robotics industry, I got to see firsthand how resources and funding for ocean innovation have largely been monopolized by private interests like fossil fuel and defense. Meanwhile, public funding for oceanographic research and science has been dwindling globally as well. And so there's this real systemic problem of where, is these where are these innovations going to come from to solve these issues that we face that need to be addressed 10 years ago, let alone today. And that's where we started Seaworthy Collective. So our mission, this is the only slide I'll read verbatim because it's pretty important. Uh, it is to build and empower a community of current and aspiring ocean innovators and entrepreneurs known as sea change makers with the knowledge, guidance, and resources to create their own startups to take on these global problems that need dedicated ocean science, conservation, and exploration. It's a lot, it's a big mission, and to tackle that requires a lot of resources, planning, and dedication. And so to do that, we're starting what's called, well, first off, a startup community, and we're community first, uh, but as well as transitioning eventually to being an incubator. An incubator basically is this hub for ideas before you even get to a startup. It's a hub for generating ideas that we help you grow from the ground up with the infrastructure that we provide. And our goal is to actually grow the blue economy as a whole, especially focused in South Florida, to not just be sustainable, but regenerative. And what that looks like means pushing for solutions that aren't just, you know, recycling plastic, but instead getting plastic out of the, out of the supply chain altogether. It's pushing for things like aquaculture, which is allowing fish populations in the wild to regenerate rather than trying to sustainably pull from fish. The list goes on. It's a really amazing community up in itself as far as the regenerative economy goes. And it's a really exciting thing to be promoting for the blue economy as well. So how are we gonna do that? Uh, we've assembled a amazing group of 21 diverse mentors which Jeff and Ian both are, as well as seven strategic collaborators. And that list is growing by the week. Uh, we just had Beneath the Waves, who's a major contributor to Shark Week, come on board, and we're really excited about that. Additionally, South Florida has an amazing ecosystem for both startups and the ocean space, and we're primed to leverage that, not only being based out of the University of Miami Rosensteel School, but beyond that as well. Last and most importantly, and why you're here, we put together events like this featuring panels of experts and founders who are here to both inspire you with some of their cool stories, but also give you the expertise, knowledge, and perspective to be able to approach this, the ocean space and, and innovate. And then we actually are here to empower you with workshops for things like leadership skills, ideation strategies, big picture thinking, all of these things that in the traditional ocean, you know, ocean space, we aren't necessarily introduced, introduced to in the process of getting into the field. And last but not least, what we're probably most excited about is ending up with a pitch competition, which we're gonna have later this fall, networking events to get to know each other, and eventually ending up in an incubator program to help fund and grow your ideas. Last but not least, how to join us. So on our bottom of our web, uh, homepage on our website, there's a little uh, link to join. If you submitted to uh, register for this event, then you're already on our mailing list. Be sure to follow us on our Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, all of that good stuff. And now my spiel's over. Let's get this, let's get this show on the road. <laughs> All right. All right, Jeff and Ian. So for you guys, uh, let's just get started with a little bit about you guys. So tell us about your backgrounds, how you got into ocean science and exploration, and and you know, love to know your stories. Jeff, do you want to go first? 
since you offered, sure. So, <laughs> <laughs> so graciously, my name is Jeff Cayley. I'm originally from Virginia up in the mountains. So how did I roll downhill and end up um, living and working on the water? Um, uh, I, I give it three reasons. One, Legos. Two, David Maculay's book, The Way Things Work. And three, uh, Bob Ballard's book, The Bismarck, where he, you know, uses this really cool storytelling of both from the, the view of sailors, but also the view of the people who went to recover the sh find and recover the shipwreck or find and, and survey the shipwreck. So as this you know, kid who wasn't really near the mountains at all, I got into engineering, was really inspired by the storytelling to you know, explore underwater and why we should explore underwater um, to the point where when I was in fifth grade, I wrote one of these, where do you see yourself in 30 years? And it included things like Woods Hole, Meet My Wife, Find a Shipwreck, which have <laughs> eerily come true. Um, so, so you know, thirty some years on, here I am up in up on Cape Cod, living the dream. So, that's the short of it for me, Ian. Yeah, I um, I gotta say, I, I kind of have the same story as you, Jeff. I uh, originally wanted to actually be a history teacher and a football coach. Uh, so that's what I went to school for originally was was teaching um, and kind of wanted to go down that, that pathway, which was where I'm from in a small town in Pennsylvania. A lot of people do. We, you know, football is really big there. And so that was kind of it. You became a teacher and, and you know, got back into sports. Um, but about 2012, 2013, I took a wetlands ecology course in Virginia out on, uh, man, I forget the name of the island. Um, it was near Assateague National or uh, State Park. From that, that led into a coral reef ecology course down in the Florida Keys um, at Long Key. And not long after that, I ended up actually meeting uh, Dr. Keen Haywood, who is the director of the exploration science program that Daniel is in. Uh, it didn't take very long for Keen to convince me to go down to uni uh, University of Miami as well um, and enroll in this exploration science program. I, I think I was in one of the you know the first couple cohorts for, uh, from it. But uh, for me, I, I fell in love with the ocean from those those. Um, um, gradual experiences of learning from the wetlands ecology courses down to the coral reefs and just fell in love with it. Um, loved the, uh, the program that they have down at Miami. And from there, I was able to transition into an internship uh, with the company that I'm at now, Limblad Expeditions. I joined them as a uh, dive intern on one of their vessels. Um, got to go out with them for a little bit. Actually uh, was able to have the opportunity to go down to Antarctica and dive with them, which was uh, pretty wild for a kid from Pennsylvania who had no uh, experience in the ocean growing up. Um, and then came back, finished my master's degree, spent a couple months in Miami working on some private boats, and they offered me a job out here in the Seattle office. So now I work for Limblad Expeditions. Um, as Daniel mentioned, our partner is National Geographic. So we are the the, I'll say the ocean going arm of their expedition program, where they've got the air, sea, and land. Um, we are the sea portion of that. So uh, in my role, I get to oversee all the expedition equipment that's on our vessels, um, as well as some charter ships, guest activities, you know, kind of cool things like that. So still involved with science to a pretty good degree, uh, but also involved in um, just, you know, say emerging technologies and things that, uh, that we're able to put out onto our ships and, and um, let our staff naturalists have at. So um, I guess that's kind of a long answer for me, but that's kind of the short of it as well. Long answers are, are definitely encouraged. Uh, you know, I think it's really amazing that you don't have to have a specific background to get into this space. You just have to find kind of the right inspiration and path that will lead you to where you want to be. And that's hopefully what we're looking to make people aware of here. Uh, so my next question for you guys is, what are some cool discoveries and notable expeditions you've added to make in your career? Jeff, you want to start on this one? I got to make me go first again. Okay. Um, <laughs> I'll take the next one. I'll, I'll take this one since Daniel suggested. So I had the amazing opportunity um, since for the last 10 plus or minus, I'm counting in decades now, years, um, I've been both a student and then a researcher at the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution. And one of um, the opportunities I had was participate in a cruise to, in the Western Caribbean to search for the, uh, the shipwreck of the Galleon San Jose, which was kind of the epitomal treasure galleon of the um, conquistador age that would travel between uh, the, the Caribbean, the Western South America, as well as, as Europe and, and carry back um, goods and, and people. So we, um, the, the, the first two months or the, the first two weeks, um, earlier in the year when we went down, we found out where it wasn't, which is also useful, 
but uh, we were very fortunate to be there at the moment that which we were able to discover the, the, the shipwreck as well during the second the second expedition went out in November of 2015 I believe it was so I had the amazing opportunity to be the first person to see pictures of the shipwreck because we were using an autonomous underwater robot so no this is not something that you're flying with a joystick you're not physically there you you write a program throw the robot over the side and hope that it comes back uh, and even hope it sees something interesting while it's down there and in this case during the mission it saw uh, the the shipwreck so I got to look at the images in my bunk and be the only person in the world for about 15 minutes who knew that we had found the shipwreck and, and what it looked like so that was that to me was a really cool moment of discovery even though it's not kind of the same, like if you're in a person in a submarine down there seeing it, um, it, it was still a, a, a really cool experience. And sort of looping back to the, the storytelling that Bob Ballard did with how those moments of discovery, it's a really difficult issue to tell the story from a robot perspective in a way that's really palatable to a, a human general audience because people want to hear the human story and the human story is well, I was sitting in my bunk and then I was hitting next, 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 next. And then all of a sudden a picture popped up with the cannon in it. But the robot story is, you know, it's, it's trying to fly over the bottom, maintain an altitude. There's currents pushing it off course. There's noise in its sensors. So how can you, you know, one of the things that I think about is how do you tell that story so that it's equally engaging? Because these are really, really cool discoveries being made in underwater but it, it's there are so many I'm, I'm getting way off topic but there are so many peculiarities to why working in the ocean is is difficult and more difficult than working on another planet even so yeah. um yeah I, I found a shipwreck it was cool there's my, there's my story there <laughs> you know I, I I like to say ocean engineering is harder than aerospace but it's a contentious point um you know I, it it really is true though there's there is this challenge of you know how do people appreciate an engineer on a computer being an explorer, right? Versus as Ian, I'm sure is gonna to touch on actually being in the water and being the one to see the cool things and us just sitting on the boat being jealous. Uh, <laughs> yeah, you, wanna, you wanna share your, your side? <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's, that's tough to follow up on. I certainly yeah. haven't discovered a shipwreck or, or anything close to that. Um, my, the cool things that I've been able to do with this, and, and I gotta just preface this with, um, it hasn't really been like a technology that's, that's allowed me to, to do these things, such as in Jeff's case, the, uh, the AUVs. Um, but for me, just the platforms and the, the just being in that, um, I'll say environment. So my, um, my first one that I was thinking about when you, when you asked about this the other day, Daniel, was uh, in, when I was uh, living and working for the National Park Service in the Florida Keys. So I was uh, living in the Dry Tortugas National Park, if anybody's familiar with that. It's 72 miles west of Key West. So you can only get there by seaplane or by boat. 99% um, of it's underwater. And it's actually got some of the highest rates of shipwrecks in the world. Um, I was working out there as, a, as an intern, again, doing uh, lionfish population surveys and um, just kind of generally helping with the Submerged Resource Center folks that were working out there from the National Park Service. Um, and two of the notable things that happened when I was out there was they actually discovered, I was on the boat when it happened, um, discovered a cannon uh, when, inside an area that had been surveyed multiple, multiple times over and over. Um, they had they'd done um, uh, just kind of transects back and forth and all of a sudden this thing just popped up on the magnemometer. I think that was the tool they were using. Um, and so it was kind of cool. They, we just dropped a buoy down right there and, you know, oh, wow, you know, they found a cannon. So um, I don't know if they ever figured out, I left um, right after that to go to my Limblad, uh, Limblad internship. So I don't know if they um, we're able to figure out what ship it came from or not, but that was just really cool just to be there in that moment, like Jeff Jeff mentioned, where you're just, you know, it's just kind of out there, you're floating, it's hot, you're sunburned, and all of a sudden it's this really, really cool thing that happens that just kind of, you know, stops the whole show and that's the focus. Um, the second one was, uh, again, going back to the lionfish uh, work that we were doing there. As I'm sure a lot of you know, lionfish are incredibly invasive all along the eastern seaboard from, I think, Massachusetts down to Brazil, basically. Um, they're kind of this, this pretty terrible superfish. Um, and while we were there, we would go, we'd, we'd find them underwater. You know, we were diving all over the national park. Um, and then we'd harvest them, bring them back, take out the occipital bones, um, just kind of do some, some basic research on them to find out, you know, how, you know, just the size, weight, things like that. Um, and then we would cut their, their bellies open. And I don't know, I was never able to confirm if this was the first case of it or not, but we've, uh, we think we had the first case of lionfish cannibalism 
in the Gulf of Mexico. So we, we cut open a uh, lionfish and there was a baby lionfish in the lionfish. And so not again, not anything as cool as like a shipwreck or anything, but still just, you know, really interesting stuff that was, you know, while you're there in the moment, just like, wow, like this is, this is really, really cool. Um, and then the, the, probably the coolest thing I've gotten to do with Limblad, aside from going to Antarctica, which um, was absolutely amazing, was this past March, we, again, going back to um, the platforms that, that we're able to cultivate with these, uh, with Limblad, with the technologies that we have, um, is we actually contracted with NASA and we were able to rent, we we're one of the first, actually, I'm sorry, the first commercial company to ever rent part of their neutral buoyancy lab pool, which is their six million gallon pool, just absolutely gigantic. Um, and we got to actually train in this pool while astronauts were in the water working, doing simulated uh, spacewalks on a model mock-up of the International Space Station. Um, so we were in the water doing diver safety and rescue drills, bringing people up on the Zodiacs that we had um, brought in. They had ACDC uh, back in black, uh, uh, blaring on the underwater speakers that were in the pool and there was two astronauts in there that we could just look over because you know the visibility is hundreds of feet and so you could just look over and these guys are wrenching away on you know whatever project they were working on so um so again not not really anything that's adding to the the science or you know the the history of discovery like jeff's shipwreck but still you know it's for me personally really really cool stuff that that i've um you know i was able to do with with both of those organizations i actually know exactly about the pool i got to get trained for escaping a helicopter underwater at that same pool. Fun, fun fact, it's, it's a thing for oil companies, but um, that's pretty cool. It was minus trying to hold your breath for long enough to like kick out the window. It was, it was, it was one of my like nine lives, you know, near death. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. it's, a really, it's a really cool facility. Mm -hmm. uh, but you know, I think the, the point that you touch on it, it's, that's probably important for people here is exploration and, and scientific discovery takes a lot of different forms. I mean, it can be shipwrecks or it can be lionfish cannibalism. I mean, it's, the, the thrill is still there. The, the, the novelty is still there. And I think when, when people think about approaching these things, I'm literally taking uh, Kenny Broad's class right now on, uh, you know, basically planning our own expeditions and stuff, but it's, there's so many little discoveries to be made and more importantly, understanding to be had for, the state of our oceans in whether it's plastic content in our water or you know what the actual state of our fisheries are you know that people don't even realize our, our opportunities um, and so I think it's a really really great point that you bring up Ian. Um, moving on Ian I'm going to go back to you on this one. Uh, so as far as the innovations that are either emerging uh, or you know that you think can be uh, relevant or impactful in the, in your field and in your experience, what what do you see coming down the pipeline, Ian? Yeah, do you do you mean like technologies of the future that have yeah. us excited? Yeah, technologies of the future, methods, practices, all that. Yeah. Um, so there's a couple things that I was thinking about this morning that that really were relevant to me. Um, the first being just the the general advancement in dive technology. So um, to go back to Antarctica, you know, the the increase in um, dry suit technology, um, regulator technology, things that allow researchers to actually go into the places that they haven't been able to go before, stay there longer and stay there in a more safe manner to, you know, whatever kind of science that they're doing, whether they're doing photogrammetry or just taking pictures or taking samples or, um, you know, just, just generally observing what's there. And so really being able to get into these spots um, through just general scuba equipment, um, to me really has me excited because there's been so many good advancements and you know everything that i mentioned before just it, it doesn't have to be polar it could be it could be really anything it could be you know stuff that you're doing in your dive classes um with rick and robbie at, at the university of miami um the second thing that has me really excited and this is kind of uh i'd say in jeff's wheelhouse is uh auv and rov technology so those are some of the things that i manage for Limblad. Um, when I say manage, I mean just send in for repairs when they need them and, and generally babysit <laughs> so, some uh, 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 yeah, pieces, pieces of equipment that can go down. Um, but anyways, all, all joking aside, the, the advancement in things such as thruster capabilities, uh, lighting apparatuses, camera systems, tether um, technologies that allow these ROVs and AUVs to go down uh, as deep as they are. And, and as Jeff mentioned, um, you know, run these courses, uh, more so AUVs where they run these courses and transects and they come back. Um, that really has me excited because when I joined Limblad, 
we had a couple ROV systems that were, I would say probably, probably north of $150,000 per system. And they were always breaking, you know, so we had a big issue with those. And, you know, last week I got off the, the phone with a company in Canada who has all of the same technologies that those original systems had. So 4k video, you know, depth ratings of a thousand feet, tethers um, that, you know, have 800 pounds of braking strength. So never lose them all thrusters that allow it to go forward, back, left and right, laterally up and down, um, you know, basically taking all of the big ROV and a, I'm sorry, ROV um, technologies that you'd see like in uh, a Bob Ballard expedition and bringing those down into a package that costs, you know, 15, 20 or $30,000, which I realize still is a lot of money, but in terms of where it was and how expensive those things are, where they are now is really, really exciting. I mean, we have, I would say upwards of eight ROVs across all of our ships, ones that go down to a thousand feet and one that are ones that are battery powered and go down to, you know, a couple hundred feet, but they're, you know, they're, it's able, it's, a, um, it's allowing folks to dip their toes into this technology and just explore on their own. And it's allowing organizations access to this technology that previously wasn't there. So that, that really has me excited. And, and just generally, you know, 4k, you know, footage of things that you've never seen before is just, awesome. So being able to bring that back and share that with people like we do, you know, immediately on the ships is really, really um, exciting and has, has me excited for the future of where that goes. Uh, and the third one, just to wrap it up for me, and this is something that I've kind of been just following recently myself. I'm by no means involved with it. I'm just an interested observer. Um, big data and cloud computing has really, really caught my attention recently with the, the ability to, uh, and all these sensors that we have across the world, how all the data that they're collecting, I mean, it's, it's so much, it's, it's almost too much, but the advancements that you know, researchers such as Jeff and his colleagues have been able to make, um, you know, folks at say Google, Microsoft, these bigger tech companies, taking their, you know, say machine learning um, algorithms and applying it to these data sets to help us better understand earth science systems and, and say resource management, how we can better resource, I'm sorry, manage the resources that we have, that really has me excited. You know, I, I know just um, a couple of days ago, I saw that Google has been using some of their um, satellite tracking technology through a Google Earth engine to track illegal fishing fleets that tiptoe around the borders of marine protected areas. You know, they turn off their AIS transponder systems and say, oh, we were never here, but there's footage and there's actual tracking that they're able to do to show, you know, yeah, you are there. And so it's, it's not so much a traditional you know, see it with your eyes, hear it with your ears type of expedition or exploration technology, but just data exploration and finding answers and solutions to some problems in data sets that are just enormously huge for us to comprehend. Um, that The future of that just really has me excited. Well, you touched on a lot of good points there. And honestly, if I commented on each one, you never leave. But what I will say is I think one of the key ones that you, you touched on that I think is a really important issue for our time is accessibility and, and ocean accessibility and the fact that, as you said, ROVs and, and underwater vehicles historically have been cost a pretty penny. Uh, most of the ones I've worked with are usually a couple million. Um, and, uh, you know, getting ROVs now into the hands of, you know, even amateur scientists, people who just want to get into the field, um, it vastly improves you know, our ability to see what's in places that, you know, you'd think were already explored, but really have barely been touched. Um, so Jeff, you wanna expand a little bit more on, on your end? Sure, I think Ian hit some fantastic points that, um, cool. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, as, as far as this sort of weird <laughs> that the, the increase in technological capability of AUVs and RVs has created this data problem, which then big data is, well poised to solve. I mean, I've seen in graduate school where biologists who all of a sudden have pictures, like they, you know, scuba dive down, take some pictures along a quadrat survey or do like a point count method. And then they, then AUV collapse like this very dense series of pictures over, over their survey site. They, they can't analyze all the pictures. They're stuck, you know, taking every 10th, 20th picture and then doing an exhaustive manual analysis. So there's this, there's this interesting dichotomy, I, I guess, not to get, too much into what Ian's already said, but I think spot on with AUVs and ROVs, as well as spot on with AI and big data having a huge role to play in ocean exploration. Now, given the opportunity Daniel's given me to shamelessly plug my, my startup company, um, I think one of the, re <laughs> the really exciting things, and I'm incredibly biased at this, 
is um, this concept of asymmetric propulsion, which myself and several others at Hui invented several years ago. And this, I'm, I'm, you can't tell I'm really excited about this. The, the idea is, a, is allow a robot with a single motor to propel itself um, as well as to maneuver. So typically for an AUV or autonomous underwater vehicle, they're torpedo shaped, they're streamlined, they're designed to go long distances efficiently and conduct surveys. And they'll typically have one propeller in the back and fins or some means to actuate to turn. So the propeller pushes it and the fins turn it, but it needs to have forward velocity in order to maintain control authority with its fins. Um, with this invention we have, we, instead of a multi-bladed propeller, we reduce that to a single bladed propeller. And instead of having the propeller move at a constant rate, we control the velocity throughout the rotation. So for instance, it's gonna go faster on one side than, than the other. And that induces a turning moment in addition to forward thrust. The metaphor I like to use is if you're in a canoe and you're paddling, you have a single paddle, you paddle harder on one side, you go forward as well as turn. And we figured out how to control that in a way where we can not only maneuver uh, an underwater robot in the way that it typically would with fins, but we also have much better control authority at very low speeds to the point where we're working right now on an NSF grant to demonstrate that we can hold station over a target. And that to me signals this huge capability where you have this streamlined vehicle, which could do a big survey, but if it sees something on the seafloor or if it captures something in the data, what does it do? It keeps going on its survey. You could, you know, it could turn back and maybe do another pass, but to really interact with it in a way that, you know, someone like Ian or an ROV might, you need station keeping capabilities to hold, to hover over that target, to possibly in the future manipulate it, collect it, what have you. And we see this as, as a really cool technology that can enable that without needing all, you know, 16 different thrusters all over the vehicle to hold station. Um, if we can do that with, with a single motor, uh, that would be huge to dramatically lower the cost of the system, lower the simplicity. Um, even less holes through the hull is nice in that you have lower your chances of, of getting a leak. Um, so we are really, really stoked that this is going to be the next big thing in marine propulsion for underwater robots. Um, and our company is called Armada Marine Robotics. You can check out the website, armadamarinerobotics.com. We're not very creative with naming, but there are a couple of videos on the site where you can see this, uh, our little prototype vehicle with a, with a thruster on the back kind of doing an, I call it an Austin Powers turn, kind of going back and forth and holding with the idea that <laughs> in, incorporate the visual feedback, which we're working on this fall, we'll be able to hold station over a target on the seafloor and demonstrate that. But when you look at that video, keep in mind, it's just a single motor with a single uh, blade rotating at different speeds. There's, there's no other fancy magic. It's really just, you know, it's, it's a little, you know, you're a little paddling in a canoe back and forth. I don't, it's, it's kind of hard to, to explain, but I'm just very excited about it. So I'll, I'll end there. <laughs> I'm in a scientific diving class right now, and we're trying to learn to hold station as people on one point, and it's hard enough. So I, yeah, can only imagine the levels of complexity when you start to get an AUV or an ROV uh, doing the same. Uh, well, we have one more time for one more question before we jump to the Q and A, and this one's a more, more general, less technical. So if we got too engineer nerdy with you guys, sorry about that, but happens. Um, the last question I have for you guys is: What advice do you have for aspiring ocean scientists, explorers, innovators, and entrepreneurs? Uh, Ian, you want to start on this one? Yeah, sure. Um, advice, my. My advice would be find people that are doing things that you're interested in and find a way to reach out to them. So whether that's, you know, through just finding their email, alumni association, LinkedIn, um, you know, whatever it might be, kind of get the, the word networking out of your head and try to build relationships with people that you can ask questions with, you know, and just generally have a, have a, um, I'll say a, a, just a low key conversation asking about the, you know, what, what they're working on, um, what projects have them excited, um, what some of their obstacles are, some of their issues, and just try to generally find the things that you're interested in yourself um, out in the real world. So you can kind of, you know, I'd say forge your path forward of, of what it is that you want to do 
Um, but, you know, you, you only learn so much in school or you only learn so much, um, you know, in the research that you're doing or whatever it is, the more data points that you have from people out there doing real work um, to figure out, you know, hey, am I interested in this? Or, you know, ah, maybe that's not so much for me. Finding that and just kind of bouncing off those back and forth, I think will really help you figure out um, your path forward. And it, it certainly has for me. Um, and, you know, as well, I wanted to mention too, Daniel, for everybody that's here, you know, if, if anybody's ever interested in, in reaching out to me or just, you know, just chatting about stuff, I'll, I'll give you guys my email at the end of this. Um, but you know, just general in, uh, advice is to just reach out and just form relationships, you know, like through Daniel, um, just try to build a community for yourself and be a part of other communities as well, I, I think would be would be it for me. Yeah, I mean, Ian, you, you touch on a beautiful point in why, and I didn't even mention it as far as why we started Seaworthy, but part of it too is, you know, we, we, we think, you know, Woods Hole or, or Limblad and Nat Geo are, are these like far off things that we can't, you know, reach or, or have access to. And it's opening people's minds to networking is as easy as getting an email. Or, I mean, for me, when I interned at Hui, it was finding 30 emails of different researchers I could work with and, and just blasting to all of them. Um, a lot of people are are hesitant to take that step and, and just kind of cold call. But, you know, we're the, the thing about, I think, being out on, on boats and on the water is you have to be a people person if you're going to last uh, an extended period of time at sea with other people in an enclosed space. So uh, <laughs> it's, a, it's a little unknown, unknown secret. So, you know, it's really, really an amazing opportunity to just be able to connect and uh, definitely encourage all of you guys to reach out if you have any more questions for Ian or Jeff. Um, Jeff, uh, your, your response to the question? Um, I don't want to say Ian stole my answer, but I do think that, you know, you said don't call it a network. I think it's absolutely, you know, you are building a network, but if you treat it, like you said, building relationships, just, you know, talk to people, don't give up, keep, you know, obviously if you have a question, you're excited about something, go with that excitement, find somebody else who's excited about it, engage them with that excitement. Um, innovations, I mean, we like to think this is the one great invention and sure, maybe the story that I have is is told in a way that makes it seem like it's, you know, one person scribbling in the dark trying to figure out an answer to something. It takes so much time, so much teamwork to, to make things come to reality, building those people's skills. And you're not going to, even if you have the best idea in that dark room, and if it doesn't leave that, that room with you and, and get out to the world and get people who are also excited and want to experiment, try it, break it, make it better. Um, it's, it's all about collaboration and it's all about, like Daniel said, being a people person and just getting out. And I think Daniel's done a great job with Seaworthy with that. Um, he made me excited to be here. So that's, that's awesome. So congratulations, Daniel, on, on Seaworthy and everyone else. Um, congratulations on your future accomplishments. Thank you. Wow. Well, I, I, I'm here to prop up you guys, but, uh, but I appreciate it. Uh, <laughs> you know, it's, it, it really is true, though. There's this, there's this need for radical collaboration in the ocean space. I think that's, that's been one of the themes that I've really learned in my last few weeks of really putting Seaworthy out there is there are a lot of separate efforts to attack the same problems. And it's how do we bring people together, have these conversations, get people on the same page to say, wait, let's just start at basics and think, how do we approach these problems together rather than disjointedly? Um, and well, speaking of questions, that leads us straight into our Q&A. And I've seen quite a few already popping up here. Um, if you want, you can, we can, I think everyone has the ability to unmute. Um, so if you want to read your question, Isabella, you want to start with your question? Sure. Yeah. My question was kind of answered, but that's great. If you guys have any other <laughs> comments, um, just because my question was, what's something that like is exciting you guys right now about the work you're doing? Are you seeing anything that's coming out that's exciting you? Anything you really want to um, get into and, and research and become uh, a little more on top of as it's coming out? Um, you kind of answered it, but if you have any more things that you think are are really cool about what you're doing now, that would be awesome. Yeah, I think for me, um, I got to go back to, I'd say more technical skills. So learning more about, not want to say machine learning and, and things of that nature, but um, just learning more about big data and the cloud. That really, uh, to me, seems like a, a, that would be a big part of the future of science exploration and just the entire field of um, discovery as well. So um, yeah, I mean, I've, I've done scuba diving, um, ROVs, you know, paddle boards, kayaks, all the, all the fun toys. 
Um, but yeah, personally, that's just, that's really where my head's been at. And so just trying to wrap my head around how does Google or Microsoft or, you know, whoever, you know, how do they build these systems and these platforms and how are people using them to, um, I'll say, aid in, in science? I think for, uh, if I can follow that up as well with, with what, what's interesting to me is not at all what I thought would be interesting, which is I have this, you know, cool technological concept that I'm working on in this startup. But now the, the question is, okay, well, what does the market look like? Who are the customers? What's the product? What's your, what's your supply chain? So there's all these more business type management questions that I had no idea I'd be answering when I and got it even into the ocean science realm. And it's really sort of those those questions around the, the the larger technologies how how is your technology going to be real who's going to use it how are you going to make it usable and to sort of cross that gap between demonstrating a concept in a laboratory and creating a commercial product that's actually going to see use by people who aren't in your immediate sphere so that that to me personally is what's sort of driving me right now and also frustrating me at the moment so um, i don't know if that answered your question but that's uh Something that yeah, no, def definitely interesting. And I'm sure that a lot of people have found that through what they do too, is that you start on something you're excited about. And then all of a sudden there's so much else that you have to think about that you're like, oh my gosh, I didn't realize that that's a part of it. And that's a part of it. So yeah, no, that's really cool. And I think it kind of goes hand in hand with what you said, Ian, with kind of all these people coming together over the internet and having data now and figuring out what their questions are. Yeah. yeah. So thanks guys. That was really interesting. And, and I can Absolutely. definitely second entrepreneurship being its own exploration journey as well. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, next question I got, uh, Jonathan, you want to un un ask your question? Yeah. I mean, Jeff answered it partially and, and Ian, you've since, you know, shown me that your, your mind works in the same way. So I'm going to fly through the question real fast and with a follow-up. Um, the idea is that, you know, now there's a lot of autonomous vehicles out there. You see sail drone and so far also dropping sort of sensors in the ocean that are floating in free currents. And, and so we now have this abundance of data. And so my question was kind of layered. And the, the first thought was like, as we see this abundance of data coming now from autonomous sensors, it's taken a sensor burden or a collection burden sort of off of the, the, the manned ROV missions. And so as such, do those missions now now have the opportunity to take on more complex sciences. Um, and the, the, the next question around that is, is with data now being sort of prolific and near real time, um, does it become overwhelming to the point that traditional science methodologies can no longer be applied to that data set? Um, lastly, the follow-up to that, you know, and you guys both are answered some of that already. The, the, the real question is, um, do these opportunities provide us with the chance to look at science differently rather than do a capture, a collection, an analyzation of data that is already stale by the time the ROV comes up, um, where you might not have access to it globally for science or problem solving um, for many months until a paper comes out, right? Um, can we look at it doing it differently now, the democratization of that data through um, ongoing processes? Look at like what Schmidt Marine is doing. They're trying to open up, you know, their data set to people to do science, you know, right away while the sub's still down. Um, anyway, I don't, I don't know where my question is in there, but you can riff on that if it sparks any ideas for you. Um, yeah. Democratization, real-time data processing, new sciences, period. Sorry, thanks. Yeah. No, Jeff, you want to take, take a lead? Yeah, um, I'm, I'm trying to remember all the different prospect points. <laughs> there's, some ones. There, there's two I'm going to jump on. One is that from a market standpoint, one of the cool things we're seeing is that oceanographic data is now being marketed as data as a service. So it's no longer you're going out collecting data and analyzing it. There are actually companies who have found a profitable model to go out and collect data and sell that data. So that is fantastic and that they're turning a profit. We're getting more data. It may not be you know, freely available in open source, but the fact that there is a market strategy that exists in the ocean environment that can be profitable, I think is very exciting. Uh, to, the, to the second point that at least I have in my head to that is how do you best utilize resources when you are a person on a ship with an ROV? Uh, I think Bob Bowers done a little bit of this with telepresence and using the way he, the AUVs can be used is to find the interesting spots to then focus your time over um, spots that are more interesting. So you're not necessarily using the ship towing a side scan looking for interesting locations to drop the ROV or the manned submarine. You're using one or multiple autonomous agents to then look over a larger area, find what's more interesting so you can better utilize your resources. And there's probably 
uh, oh, I think Ocean Infinity, who's also called themselves Armada, we'll have to see about that, has a lot of surface platforms that are aiding unmanned underwater vehicles doing this. So I think there's this really cool hierarchy that's forming of how you actually focus down on what is the most interesting aspect of the survey you're doing and then better manage your time because when you're paying for ship time, time is very much money. Um, so that is, I think that, that's a really interesting point too. Um, turn it over. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I, I would have, so just thinking back through the questions that you had, the, the two things that come to mind for me, and this actually um, dovetails nicely with what Jeff said, is the, um, uh, the democratization and marketability of these data sets. Um, you know, I've been working with so far, originally when they were open ROV, we have a number of their ROVs on our ships. And we use them for really just quick deployments. If we just see something cool, we want to throw it in. Um, and I'm not sure if they want me telling this to anybody at this point right now. But one of the things that they were been talking about is with all these data and these sensors that they have spread across the ocean is actually coming up with weather um, modeling and, and being able to sell that data to people like us at LimbLab where we can use that as more accurate weather data um, out in the oceans when we're actually, you know, doing long crossings or if we got long expeditions versus using, um, you know, so like a, a NOAA weather forecast or something. So kind of more real time right there in the moment. Um, so that, that's been kind of cool. And then the second thing that I, that kind of came to mind when you were talking about the ROVs, I don't know if it'll generally change the way science is done. I think, uh, and I do agree with you that there's definitely an overload of data that is now coming from these from these platforms for sure. But I think as we get better with processing all of this data and and having all of these you know expanded uh, points of of interest that we want to collect, bring them together, I think it'll allow us to just get a better understanding of the whole picture of what we're looking at. So just for a quick example, before we we, we I don't want to take up too much time. You know, ROVs back in the day, a lot of it was you know, direct observation, and, and that's what you put the RV in the water for. Nowadays, you know, even these smaller ones, um, you know, so far it's not one of the companies, but companies like Deep Trekker, um, yeah. Boxfish, um, some of these guys, when you can put sonars, CTDs, water temperature, um, uh, salinity, uh, measurement tools on all of these things. So as you're going through, you're still getting great, you know, HD or 4K footage of what you're actually going to look at. Um, you're able to, you know, keep position over where you want to be, but you're also able to collect a lot more data that gives you the whole picture of what's going on in that that environment right there. So, um, so for us, I mean, that that has a lot of you know exciting stuff because we at Limblad we. Um, we travel all over the world. We've got 10 ships that go pole to pole, um, the Caribbean, uh, the South, South Pacific, um, Southeast Asia, all over these places. And so we're looking at ways right now. And, you know, we've got all this great, um, say, water temperature data, um, weather data, all these things. How do we consolidate this and then aid and give this back to people who are doing research, right? So, so that, that's where I see a lot of this going is, is more so um, we've got all of this data. How do we start to, or not start, but how do we continue to make it available to people and, and um, you know, make it worthwhile, I guess. I, I don't really know how to exactly how to end that, that statement, but um, that, that's kind of where I see it going is just being better at managing multiple, multiple, multiple points of data that we're collecting all at once to get a bigger picture of, of the actual science of, of what we're looking for. Well, you covered it. Thank you guys both. Awesome. Yeah, hopefully. I was like a seven layer. Well, well, well I, I wouldn't have been able to answer that. Before. That was good. It, it threw me for a loop. I was like, huh, what do we want to do with these ROVs? <laughs> All right, well, we got one last question, time for one last question, and then uh, we'll move into our final discussion period. Uh, Michael Collins, do you want to unmute and ask your question? Uh, yes, please. Can people hear me? Yep. Yep. Sure. So I have uh, two questions. Just grab whichever one uh, kind of strikes you. Um, first is that, you know, if you're going out to sea, that can be a very expensive proposition to be running a, like, fully staffed ship for a week or two at a time. With all of the advances that are being made in robotics and um, being able to get autonomous sensors out there, do you see role for a sort of like democratization of doing ocean science, you know, getting it down to the level of having like a, you know, a micro business where someone's out there chartering like a 60 foot sailboat that has a small sensor suite and that, and that, and that being like a model that scientists could hire and go out and very quickly get a project done for maybe 10 or $20,000 instead of like half a million. Um, and then second is, you know, Last time you're out at sea, do you have any like specific 
uh, you know, little, little thing or big thing that was kind of driving you crazy as far as the frustration with the technology or the way that uh, things were being done. Thank you. Thanks, Michael. I'll jump on that first question. Um, and I think with regards to the democratization of data collection as a business model, I mean, it's something we already see a lot of in, in oil and gas. Is there not the only gas companies aren't the ones collecting the data and doing the surveys or installing and inspecting. It's, it's all service companies that do that. So unfortunately, I would say if, if you're looking for a strictly only science market, return on investment is going to be a lot lower for looking to, to the sciences than it would be to looking to you know, a large energy company type, type model. So I, that's unfortunately the way I, I would see that going, but I think maybe there is an opportunity for that just because um, I'd have to do, you know, someone have to do, someone smarter than me would probably have to do a cost analysis to see what, what it would take, you know, looking at the way NSF proposals go, if, if a component of that could be a business model to, to collect data. Um, I'm, I'm not optimistic, but I, I don't want to shut the door on that either. I think it's, it'll be worth looking into. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would. I would have to agree with that. Um, something that actually came to mind when you're asking that is there's, and this is actually how I met Dr. Haywood was um, there's a company called Pangea Explorations. And I'm sure that there's other, out, other um, platforms like this out there, but it's a 72 foot sailboat that you can charter. Um, and they've gone out, I know that they've done um, cross, uh, they've gone um, transatlantic um, across the Pacific doing microplastic toes, um, just trying to get data points um, for private hire. They, they also bring guests on board. So I was actually a guest on the ship. Um, so we were able to take part in that science, almost like a citizen science um, expedition, if you will. And I think there's some some uh, potential there for, for more of that. Um, but specifically with what, you know, say back to what we're doing at Limblad is uh, you hit the nail on the head. It's very expensive to charter a ship, especially if you're going long distances across the ocean to very remote places. Because there's not that many ships that can actually, you know, say cross the Drake Passage to get to Antarctica. You, you really have to have something that is capable of doing that. Um, and so that's something that we're working on right now with the, uh, the MIT Media Lab, um, the Technology Lab for National Geographic, um, and a couple other partners is how do we how do we get scientists on board to, you know, say conduct science and take them to these places that are very hard to get to where we're already running a profitable business model of taking guests, um, say on, you know, on an expedition to these places. Um, so I, I think eventually, yes, we, we will get to, to that. Um, and I, I hope I'm answering your question here. I, I apologize if I'm getting off track. I think we will get to that point. Um, there's definitely some things that I've experienced so far that have, um, I'll say signaled towards that being a, a profitable, uh, business model at the end is, is kind of getting scientists on board these expeditions that are also allowing other people to join as well in citizen science and moving forward with that. Um, where that ultimately goes, I have no idea, but we're excited to partner with those with those folks and, and see what kind of things we can do with the data that we're collecting, the data that they want to collect, and how we, rather than just being a travel or cruise company, can um, really be a, uh, a platform for science as well. So I hope I answered that. Great, right, thank you both. Awesome, all right. Well, we have 10 minutes left here and I wanted to try to see if we could engage you all instead of just lecture at you the whole time. Uh, and we have a, a little discussion question we thought of. Uh, I'm gonna share my screen again. Uh, and we'll just spend, you know, five, 10 minutes on this and then we'll, we'll wrap up for the day. Um, so the little discussion question we have is, what parts of the ocean would you explore and why? And is there a way to just, display you guys and the screen, I don't know. But uh, yeah, if, if anyone wants to answer, feel free to unmute and, and we'll discuss. This is kind of going to the question I put in the chat, but um, you know, for me, like, sorry, um, Marty, chill code, I'm with Seaworthy, um, but very interested in, in my, like microclimates basically in the deep ocean and some of the undiscovered parts uh, around uh, thermal vents or caves and stuff like that. So really what I was kind of getting at with my question was, you know, is there something that you guys, is there a place down in the ocean that you guys would really like to discover or be a part of or a team? Is that something that you guys would be interested in? But for me, deep sea ecology, very unique species. 
the way they interact with uh, each other in very harsh environments is just like super fascinating. Anyone else can comment? <laughs> I mean, that's, that's what drove me to get into the field is actually uh, James Cameron's dive to the Marianas Trench uh, back in 2012, that was my freshman year. And then I saw the South Park afterward, which made me somewhat question it. But, uh, you know, it, it, there, there is so much down there we don't know. There's actually one of the facts that always stuck with me is we know more about the moon and Mars than we do our own oceans, right? I mean, they just got footage of a giant squid for the first time in the wild, like only within the last decade. Um, and it's a giant squid. You'd think we'd be able to find that by now. Um, <laughs> yeah. any, anyone else have, have any uh, places of interest they'd like to know more about? Uh, yeah, I've got something. So John Klein here, I'm also an NPS student, um, Exploration Sciences with Keen. Um, just doing a little work with um, Fritz Hansman, who's the underwater archeologist at Rasmus. Um, over the last year, he's taught me a lot about um, generally finding cultural artifacts along shorelines. And something that I've come to learn is that um, ancient history wise, our, as our sea levels have rose, they've covered up a lot of um, former civilizations that would have been on coastal areas. And so coastal lines have moved inland over time. And um, I just think it'd generally be interesting to see what, what sits in our shallow waters where sea levels would have been lower 200 feet, 100 feet, 300 feet. Um, because I wonder what we're missing out there that's kind of in these regions that could kind of unlock the story of um, past civilizations, things like that, that, that we're still on. And that kind of ties to the ROV and all that, and, and those kind of technologies would be an incredible application for those um, types of projects. Yeah. Yeah, with good footage. Yeah, I think for me, one of the things that I'd be interested in, in um, exploring a little bit more is that depth that's right below, say, recreational or scientific scuba limits, which is between about 130 and, and say close to 190 or 200 feet. Um, right below that, there's there's a real um, lack of, of information and data on actually what's there on, on um, some different corals that we have, um, just the, the, the marine ecosystems that are down there because it's, you know, Either you have to have an ROV or you have to be, you know, on a rebreather and certified to go down to 300 or 400 feet. Um, and that's really tough. That, like Jeff said, that costs a lot of money. And, you know, sometimes the technology doesn't work. Um, but for me, I've always been interested in, in that because it's, you know, you kind of get down to, say, 100 feet or whatever in your scuba dive and you can just see a little bit further down. It's, oh, man, I, you know, I wonder what is down there. Um, and for all the coastal areas. So that, that kind of ties into what you were talking about, John. I'm sorry, John, um, with uh, just the coastal, coastal communities and things that are just out of reach uh, for normal scuba uh, limits. And I think that would be really cool because there, there probably are some amazing things that we, I mean, I'm, I guarantee you there are uh, amazing things that we have have no idea what they are, where, you know, where they came from. So, yeah. yeah. We're lucky here in Florida, the continental shelf goes out really far. So there's plenty of space to, to see what's around. Right. But you know, on the West coast, it just drops right off and you're just like, who knows what's down there unless you take an ROV or sub down. Um, it's a, yeah, it's all, it's all, all relative to geography and, and, uh, and topography, which is out of my comfort zone, but <laughs> Awesome. Anyone else have any other thoughts before we move on to wrap up? We, I just have one quick thought. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, I just thought it was interesting, John, how you brought up kind of the coastal area too. Cause I think I remember watching something on shark week this past shark week, and we know how some things on shark week are exaggerated, but if you pick them for the science, <laughs> then um, they, they have some really interesting points. And I think there was an episode talking about how, on one coast of an island, I don't know if anyone caught this, there's like way more shark attacks happening. And they found out that it's because people are moving there and creating tourism and the, the, um, the pollutants or the chemicals and the nutrients they're releasing into the water because of that is bringing a lot of more animals around that area. Mm -hmm. So it's also just interesting because everyone wants to assume that we've like explored our coasts enough, but as we change, you know, the coasts are always going to change too. And, and you don't think about it until maybe even like 10 years later, but yeah, definitely always worth um, exploring as much as you can, even in the current day, places you think that you thought of, you already yeah. saw, you know. 
that's really interesting too, because you can't imagine that those chemicals or nutrients that are being um, released in the environment are probably the best for the marine environment either. So that'd be, I didn't see that episode in Shore but I'd be really interested to know why that would be, why there's more um, marine bio, you know, just the biomass going to that area um, versus, versus previously. Right. Interesting. I wasn't sure if Kim and Quinn had anything to add. I, I saw Quinn make a pretty cameo. <laughs> well, when I asked Quinn where she wanted to explore, oh, Quinn, hang on one second. Well, she said everywhere, but I was going to say under the ice. Um, from an ecology standpoint, there's just there's so much going on right underneath the ice. And Quinn has a squid that she'd like to share, but um, but also because that's something that's changing so fast. So this is really an area that there's really important ecology happening. That uh, you know we have a really limited opportunity. That, but it's a really technologically challenging area to access. Yeah, yeah, I, I appreciated Quinn's insight as well. Yeah. <laughs> Everywhere, uh, that's a great answer. Daniel, yeah, hi, this is your cousin. Just uh, <laughs> I think <laughs> I think for me, I've always been interested in uh, about how um, weather, hurricanes specifically, especially in Florida, how it affects. Uh, both sea life and all ecology and just uh, if I had the opportunity to do so, um, you know, following storms, I would love to to see what that impact was like. I still always look back on that tornado chaser uh, uh, show, I forgot what it was called, Storm Chasers. Yeah, that was that was always an impressive thing to watch for a number of reasons. Um, Storm Chasers. <laughs> There's always, there's always those interesting boundaries between reality, TV, and science, but that's for a totally different panel for sure. Uh, <laughs> all right, well, we're going to have to wrap up. It's almost six o'clock, and I really appreciate you all sticking it out. Um, I just wanted to, number one, thank Jeff and Ian for their time today. Really appreciate your insights. I think we had a great panel today, um, and, you know, for, uh, for kicking us off in, in a busy uh, few months to come. Uh, also, thank you to the Seaworthy team, Marty, Sierra, Isabella, Ben, Julie, and John, who have all helped us get to this point and are helping us to continue to grow. Uh, really appreciate your help as well. And uh, just looking ahead, next week, we're going to have our first ideation workshop. Uh, we're going to talk about design thinking and sustainability, featuring Vince Serena, who has a family company that does coffee, and they actually created the world's first edible espresso cup made out of biscotti. So he's passionate about single-use waste and Kayla Barber, Kayla Barber, who is one of the most passionate environmentalists I've ever met. And then uh, we actually are finalizing a beach cleanup for Saturday, September 26th. Um, and so that's all the details. You can register on our website, seaworthycollective.com slash events. Feel free to reach out with any questions you have. There are email, emails there as well. And of course, social media is always there in addition. So Thank you all again for coming. This has been awesome. Uh, really, really enjoyed the process of just getting to this point and having uh, an amazing community already to tap into. And hopefully we'll see you again soon. Yeah. Thanks everybody. And thank you, Daniel, too, for putting this together. This has been great. All right. well, yeah, thank more to you guys. Yes, thanks everyone, Daniel and Seaworth in particular. And nice to meet you, Ian. Yes, you as well. And to everybody else out there as well. I'll, I'll put my, uh, my email. I'll give my email to Daniel. Is that a good place, Daniel? Yeah, you... sure. I, I can share it. We're going to send out a follow-up email uh, to everyone, basically with the link to the video if they want to watch it. Great. We'll, we'll just put your emails on there as well. Jeff, good you're to cool. see you, Ian. Awesome. Yeah. Hey. Awesome. Thanks, everybody. It's been fun. Have a great rest of your evening. Take Thanks. care. Thank you, guys. Bye. Thanks, Quinn. <laughs> That's great. See you, Jeff. Thanks so much again. Thanks a lot, Daniel. Take care. This was great. Congratulations as well. Thank you all. There's, there's plenty more to come, man. I'm, I'm stoked. <laughs>